Ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to begin our keynote panel of this year's management conference. I want to welcome you all again and also welcome all of our friends who are joining us via the webcast. Today's panel uh, is an exemplar of what Chicago Boot does best, which is to have deep and meaningful discussion of a topic that is both current and of lasting interest. Our distinguished panelists today are Jean-Pierre Dubé, uh, Matt Genskow, Brent Hill, Eric Lefkowski, Rashad Tibakawala, and the panel will be moderated by Steve Kaplan. Please join me in welcoming our keynote panel. Okay, it looks like we're all ready. Well, welcome everyone uh, to our discussion on the business and economics of the social media, of social media and the social web. And I guess, you know, you've seen on the monitors some facts about social media and the social web, and they're pretty astonishing. Facebook has something like 600 million users right now. Uh, which is more than more people than all but two countries on the planet. Uh, almost 70 million people own smartphones in the U.S. They download uh, over time 15 billion apps from Apple and Android. Uh, even seniors are using uh, the social web. I think 13 percent of seniors who are over 65 log on to their Facebook <coughs> account every day. Uh, and their use has been growing wildly. Uh, social media, particularly Facebook and Twitter, uh, have been prominent uh, in the Arab Spring, uh, so non-business uses. Uh, Groupon uh, was the fastest company to a billion dollars in revenue and did it in, you know, how long did it take you? Good. 24 months? Maybe? Good 24 months, which is unbelievable. Uh, and uh, as of yesterday, uh, you know, it's the timing either couldn't have been better or couldn't have been worse. Uh, LinkedIn went public, and last I checked, you know, it was, uh, it was worth somewhere between $99 and $100 a share. You know, that is something like 33 times last year's revenue and 200 times last year's. EBITDA or cash flow, uh, which is pretty uh, interesting. <laughs> so what, what I, uh, I hope we'll do today is explore the economic and business model implications of this activity and try to understand what it is and where it is going to go. And uh, I'm really happy to have a great uh, panel here. Uh, they, uh, everyone here is more or less a friend of mine, which is uh, always a good thing for a moderator. Uh, Brent, Brent was a student of mine, which uh, is really exciting to have a former student. Uh, and uh, Eric taught for us, which uh, is also uh, exciting, you know, as well as uh, having founded Groupon. I should also add for Eric, for those of you who don't know, um, it's pretty amazing that you know the companies that Sunil listed. He started Inner Workings. It went public a few years later. He started Echo Global. It went public a few years later. He started Media Bank. It probably can go public. And Groupon, of course, we all know. That is four companies he started uh, in an eight-year period that are kind of public quality. And I, I don't think there's anyone else on the planet who has done that. So uh, it really is a pleasure to have Eric here. So now you know, enough of an introduction. Let's get started. Uh, when most people think about social media, uh, they think about the tools that dominate the infrastructure, whether it's Facebook, Google, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. <coughs> and so, you know, those are the tools. There are also, you know, other definitions running around. And I guess the place to start is ask each of you uh, to tell us how you define social media or the social web and uh, what it means to you. So, uh, who should I ask first? Matt, you wanna you wanna start? Probably, probably the worst person to ask for a definition of social media. I think the the remarkable thing is the definition seems to have been expanding quickly over time. So, I I spent some time trying to think about 
what is, what is a definition of social media that encompasses all of the firms that are usually grouped together like this, everything from Facebook to Groupon. And I'm not, um, you know, I think there's, there's a very specific definition, which is sites where people build explicit social networks and interact, and, and that I think I understand clearly. I'm not sure I have a clear sense of the current definition that encompasses all of these things, other than that it seems to have become something that just about everybody wants to be. So it's, it moved quickly to being uh, a term that gets applied pretty widely. Rashad? So uh, we define it as the people's network. Um, and to a great extent, we sort of define the internet as a connection engine where people connect to transact, share, express, and discover. And to a great extent, we've believed always that people have always wanted to connect and create. And now technology allows them to connect and create without the technology getting in the way. Um, and so that seems to be our basic belief is the people's <coughs> network versus you know, NBC, CBS, or anything else is going to have seismic change, and that's our definition. Eric? Yeah, I mean, um, I think you know, both those are, are probably right. I mean, it's, I, there's no, I think, in, innately perfect definition. Certainly, it's the place that today uh, people want to be in because it's the place where companies trade at um, 200 times historic EBITDA or whatever. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, but more importantly, I think it's simply um, the, way I, the way I think uh, an easy way to think about it is there are these tremendous platforms that were built, Facebook being one, Twitter being another, and businesses today can monetize those platforms uh, in, in a highly connected social context. And those companies that take advantage of that are in some way, shape, or form monetizing the social graph or monetizing the social web, and so that kind of gets lumped together with social media. But you know, there's just no great definition, and ultimately everybody in some way, shape, or form wants to be um, playing in that space, and, and if you asked Facebook how far it extends, you know I'm sure Zuckerberg would tell you everything's social, right? So so it's, it has no beginning and no end. Yeah, I like to separate the two the two words, frankly, the social side and the media side, because not everything that's designed to be social, meaning easy to share, easy to connect, easy to follow, is has a media component to it. And the media, I think about messages and digital messages in particular, whether it's videos or photos or things that people have created. And not every site has the, the media side of it. So I think that it's easy for lots of different things to get lumped into the social media category. But when you really look at what's the social activity, is there a media element or not, they're clearly not. They, they don't all have that characteristic. Well, I guess from the, the marketing perspective here, uh, first thing we want to do is separate the definition of the applications themselves, the social media, from a word that sometimes gets used synonymously with social media, which is Web 2.0, which is the technology. So marketers are mainly interested in the applications, not the underlying networking technology. I think from a marketing point of view, I think that the two keys to social media, and I'm not really offering a definition here because, like everyone else, I think this is a concept that's somewhat too vague to define. But I think the two keys for marketing are interactivity like to separate this from other media we're used to using in marketing. This is an opportunity to interact with your customers, not simply deliver messages to them, but to get something back. And in some of the most successful applications we've seen so far, to co-create. That is, that you're not just interacting with your customers, but to some extent you're jointly creating the media that's going to be feeding back into what it is your brand and what your brand is going to represent. So that so those are actually all very interesting answers. There, some of those things I think I've heard for decades, or maybe not decades, but certainly since the dot-com boom back in the, the late 90s. And there were companies you know, that were trying to do that in the past. Mercata uh, had something called WeCommerce, which is uh, a little bit like Groupon. Uh, you've had texting for a long time. So I think the, the next question is why you know, has this sort of taken off in the last few years rather than you know, 10 years ago? And is this, is this really different or is it just evolutionary? And anybody who wants to answer that, I... I I'll, I'll start with a couple of the thoughts on that. One is there's a device story 
that's emerged in the last couple of years. There are several things that we'll talk about today that are a lot less interesting if you can't look at it on the go. For example, the whole smartphone market, the iPad market, and other types of pads now make some of these services uh, available on almost 100% basis, and that's a big part of the phenomena. The second thing, the most important thing I think that's contributed to the growth in the whole category, such that we actually define it and try to define it as a category now, is that users are more expressive than they ever have been. And what's happened along the way is they've shared photos, they've shared videos, they've commented on sites, some people started to blog, other people just commented, they've rated, they've reviewed, and what it did was it warmed people up so that when you created a platform that made it really easy for them to share pieces of their lives, they were receptive to it. And that just wasn't the case 10 years ago. No one else wants to touch that. Matt, is this revolutionary, why, evolutionary? You're why now? I mean, I think, I think if you look at, <clears throat> it seems like the thing that has really exploded, in a sense, is Facebook. Facebook, in terms of the number of people using it, in terms of the influence. And I think if you look at Facebook, the kind of growth path of this alongside other technologies in the past, the growth of social media actually looks pretty typical. I think it's, it's like a little bit slower than the takeoff of VCRs, a little bit faster than the takeoff of cell phones. It's followed a pretty common evolutionary path for technologies that are important new technologies that are being rapidly adopted. So I think it happens partly, we just happen to be sitting like right at this point in the curve where, um, where that growth is, is really rapid. The other things, that it, it seems to me that's exploded, what's really changed in the last year or so is not anything in the use of these technologies or their importance in society, which have been growing in a kind of steady, gradual way, but the attention to them from, from businesses, the, the, the view of this is suddenly something that everybody needs to be thinking about or should be thinking about uh, in running their businesses. So I think, I think as a kind of, the phenomenon of businesses using these tools and thinking about what, what am I going to do as a business with Facebook and Twitter, that seems like something which has really exploded. And so all the little Facebook and Twitter icons that we now see all around us really are a new thing. But the underlying thing has been growing pretty smoothly. I think I would sort of build on the comments. and It's actually pretty dramatically different and maybe for a lot of different things coming together. The first one is it's consumer-led and not business-led. You know, a lot of the first round was business-led. Second is it's rapid iteration. It's pretty amazing how fast these things continuously improve, which is if you sort of look back. And it's not just Facebook, which is Twitter is 200 million people. Uh, you have a whole bunch of you know, interesting things. So business is almost forced to react. Uh, third is simply, it is a question of devices, but also wireless broadband access all over the world, which is the other thing that you know, has, has, has tended to happen. And, and so there's this wonderful combination of things where to a certain extent now people do consider what's on these things as more important content because it's relevant to them than even content that's produced by other people. So it's, it's a lot of different things, but it is consumer-led. It's led from the slime and not from the heavens. Because the first generation was, you know, what does Microsoft think and what does IBM think? Who cares? Mm -hmm. I, can, I, can. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think timing did play a really big role in this. I mean, sometimes it's hard to, it's, it's easy rather to forget that if we rewind 10 years, I mean, there were already sites that were using user-generated content, like Amazon, for example. Um, one of its big, one of the big way, methods or innovations for pushing sales on consumers was to allow the consumers themselves to generate the product reviews, so that at least to some extent we believe that the content on the website about the products was somewhat objective and community-generated. And we certainly had lots of online or virtual communities appearing in early 2000s. Um, I, one of my favorites I always think of is baby, as babycenter.com, having uh, been a new parent exactly at that time, I was very familiar with babycenter.com, which was actually run by an enterprise, but the objective was to create a community where parents could come and talk to each other about parenting needs and get information about at different stages of the pregnancy and in the different stages of a young child. And, I mean, that site eventually got sold to Johnson & Johnson. I don't remember the exact financial amount, but, I mean, it wasn't purchased by Johnson & Johnson as a, as a place to sell <coughs> products. It was actually purchased by Johnson & Johnson as a place where the company would sit down quietly in the background and listen to the conversations and try and gather marketing intel 
and perceptions about their products and brands and maybe ideas for yet unfulfilled needs. So I th when we try and think why did social media explode so recently, it's not I think that the concept has suddenly just been invented as much as you know, the timing is right now, the, the penetration on the internet is high, the technology and broadband has reached a point where we can actually interact in a relatively convenient and easy way that we're suddenly seeing this take off. Okay, so I guess I would summarize that as you've had some revolution, or some evolution in technology, some evolution in usage, and that's led to a revolution in what we're seeing, and it's very different. And you're all saying uh, it's very different, I think. And the next question is, how is it very different from a business perspective? What does it mean now that the consumers are more empowered, and what are you uh, seeing in how companies are reacting to that? How should they react? I mean, I think um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you gotta, you, to, to really understand the impact of what's happening today, I think you have to go to an industry where you might not see any connectivity to what, what's obviously exploding on the web. So we have a company called Echo, which, um, which is in the logistics space. And we, have, we, we hire maybe 30 or 40 people a month in Chicago for that business. And so I'll speak to the classes. These are mostly telemarketing folks that are out there trying to call, call small, medium-sized businesses all over the U.S. And if you think about the basic way in which somebody you know, historically would have done telemarketing versus how they can do it today, you can kind of see, I think, the impact of what's happening inside the social graph relative to even businesses that aren't that technical in nature, which is if you call, call somebody cold today, they're, they're, they're kind of frustrated that you didn't take the time to find some connection to them somehow, right? Using one of these tools to figure out where they go to school, who are their friends, what do they like? I mean, the amount of information that's available is exhaustive, and so you can really build really interesting um, social bridges between people, even people you don't know. And I think those businesses that are taking advantage of it, uh, both in the offline context as well as in the online context, I mean, we've talked today about Facebook and Twitter as being two great platforms for social, and yet the vast majority of Groupon's dollars that we spend go to Google, right? So, I mean, here's a, here's a, here's a search medium and a display medium that's producing unbelievable results for effectively a social commerce company. So I think um, you just have to avail yourself of these tools and find a way to, to uh, use them to your advantage. You think your customers would be happier if you called them up and, and said, we've figured out where you went to college and who your friends are, and uh, I think if you now call, we have a connection <laughs> with you? <laughs> I think if you, if, you, if you cold call somebody and say, hey, you know, um, I'm at Echo, and, and uh, I noticed you went to Indiana, you know, I, I went to Indiana as well, and go Hoosiers or whatever. That instant <laughs> context of connectivity is really meaningful versus can you spare 30 seconds of your day today to hear me give you a pitch about, I mean, if, if I can't draw a bridge to you in 10 seconds, you're going to hang up on me. So the ability to draw that bridge, I think, is invaluable. I, I think accountability is a really big part of this. That you know, back in the day, you know, the brand could lie or they could exaggerate their benefits, and nowadays I don't think that's as possible anymore. I mean, if you deceive customers, it just takes one person to find out and start tweeting that or, <coughs> or blogging about it, and next thing you know, millions of people are aware of this. I mean, this morning, I, uh, I was sharing this with Steve before the conference day, the front page of the Wall Street Journal, there's an article about Girl Guide or Girl Scout cookies, which I have a daughter who sells Girl Scout cookies, so I took a moment to read it. And it turns out that two pair of girls who were doing some project to get their bronze, their bronze medal for the, for the Girl Scouts, they were doing an awareness project on orangutans, discovered that one of the biggest threats to the orangutan is the commercial use of palm oil. The palm oil it threatens their environment, and they went around to youth groups and other centers, you know, presenting their work. They won their award. And then when they got their Girl Scout cookies to sell, realized that one of the most prominent ingredients of a Girl Scout cookie is palm oil. <laughs> And now we fast forward, not even one year later, they've partnered with an awareness group that's created a site on Facebook. They've got a following on Twitter um, trying to speak out against the sale of Girl Scout cookies. And in fact, many Girl Scout troops have announced this year they're not going to sell cookies unless they change the ingredient. This is over $700 million in revenues for the Girl Scouts of America organization. And 
this isn't the first time they had this problem. Two years ago, there was a social outcry about pushing kids to be selling cookies that were made with hydrogenated fats, vegetable oils. So palm oil was the default. It was the next best thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see from this, I mean, there, there's good news and bad news in this. I mean, another example of bad news was the Gap. The Gap changed their logo last year. Normally, these sorts of things sort of go unnoticed, but there was enough consumer backlash about the Change Gap logo that they changed it back again. So we can see that this is the bad news. The good news is, some firms that actually have a brand that's worth peddling to the market, that has virtues that are worth, worth being known to the mass market, can actually harness this and use this to their advantage. I mean, I mean, the Pepsi Refresh campaign is probably a little too early on in terms of us being able to assess whether it's working or failing, but Pepsi took away $20 million of its marketing budget last year and reoriented it towards the Refresh campaign online, which is a, I won't get into the details now on all the different aspects of this new social marketing campaign. Um, certainly generated a lot of impressions for them, and that part seems good. They claim they're getting better shelf space in stores because retailers like giving space to companies that give back to the community. Sadly, they also fell for the first time in the last 30 years to the number three brand position uh, behind Diet Coke. Interesting, last year, Coke advertised on the Super Bowl. Pepsi didn't. Pepsi decided to advertise on the Super Bowl this year. So, I mean, I guess whether or not we can harness this technology effectively is still something that's up in the air. But what is for sure is you can't sell a bad brand anymore and deceive customers. This is something that people find out en masse very quickly. I think there are, you know, you ask what's revolutionary. I think there are three very significant changes. The first one is traditionally marketing was done either it was above the line, below the line, analog, digital. Uh, and most companies are still organized that way. Uh, it's not the way marketing is going to be done, we think, in the future. It's going to be paid, owned, and earned. Uh, and what happens is how you integrate all of those. So for instance, to the point that Eric made, when we were, whenever we take clients, we basically make sure that we have the Facebook, Twitter story, we have the Google story, we have sort of the Apple story, and we connect all of those. Because not one of them alone works independently, that they're all connected. And to a great, the, the big thing is how do you manage your portfolio? You know, it's literally, it's like these are three different assets. How do you manage them? Uh, and one feeds off the other, uh, which is one. The second, which is a very significant change, is marketing is being outsourced to the end user, which is we are self-marketing to ourselves. We're going searching for things. We're looking at things. We're asking people in communities. And to a great extent, Eric's point is absolutely true which is if somebody comes to see me and has no idea, right, and I go out of my way to actually have sort of cyber presences everywhere in great detail, it's like, why are you wasting my time? You know, why are you wasting my time? And, and, and we don't want people to be creepy, but the reality of it is if you put information out there, people are going to find it. Uh, so it's, it's not, not going to find it. So that's the second aspect of it. But third, please recognize that there is a seismic shift in the stone that, and I've always said marketing used to be about meeting and understanding customer requirements. We never used to have to do that for many, many years because customers weren't empowered. Now they are, you have to meet the, the requirement. So we think it's a huge error for marketing, but there's a lot of amazing shifts, which is what's changing everything. The first to a great extent is the focus on the consumer much more than on anything else. The second is, there's lots of new money coming in. You just saw the LinkedIn thing, right? And my belief is if marketing is a sad story, how come there are billions of dollars coming into it? But the third and the most important, which is why I really call it the Renaissance, is just like in the Renaissance, there was the invention of perspective painting. There is a completely new way of going to sell stuff. And over the next 10 years, it'll become very clear. And that, the fact that the power has shifted is pretty dramatic, and will there be good and bad cases, who knows, but Pepsi was very clear they had made a mistake. We work for Coke, thank God, okay? <laughs> right? Which has more fans than Pepsi has on Facebook. But the reality of it is, you have to know what your, you, you have to know what your product is, right? And the reality of your selling, you know, fun, sweet things, don't take it too far. I think, but, it's, I think it's really important <clears throat> to, for businesses to keep a little bit of perspective on what's actually happening. There's all kinds of talk right now about seismic shifts in the way marketing today is nothing like marketing in the past. I think we tend to hear a lot of anecdotes about that, but relatively, relatively little quantitative real analysis of to what extent things have changed. I thought it would be interesting just to kind of see you know, how much time 
how big a role does this stuff actually play in people's lives right now? To what extent has you know, the social media really kind of eaten into television and other traditional media and changed the way people do things? The average American these days spends five and a half hours every day watching television. Average. There are a lot of people who spend more. That's been growing over time, so there has been no decline in the amount of time people spend watching and, television. And the webcast is not television. <laughs> and this is not television. Okay. The average American spends six minutes a day on Facebook. The average American spends four seconds a day on Twitter, on LinkedIn. That doesn't mean that these technologies aren't important, that they're not playing an important role in various ways, and that for particular businesses whose customers, say, are really focused in demographics where they're using these things a lot, that it's not relevant. But I think the view that society has been changed, maybe society will be changed at some horizon of 10, 15, 20 years by this stuff. The, the idea that society has been changed in a fundamental way already, or that marketing has been changed in a fundamental way already. I think, I think spending on social media advertising is something like you know, one sixtieth of spending on television advertising. It's, it's a very, very small share. So none of that is to minimize in any way the importance of what we're talking about today. But I think, if anything, the biggest risk for businesses today, not very much like lots of other new technologies that come along, the biggest risk is not so much being too slow to get your Facebook marketing operation up and going, but, but overreacting to this and suddenly thinking the world has changed when it hasn't. So I mean, the counter to that is that it's completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it sounds great. It sounds great. It feels like Nielsen, Nielsen did that study. I feel like it's a Nielsen study of 5.5 hours. But the, the real, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's almost, um, look, there's a re the good news is markets are efficient. There's a reason that Google's worth $200 billion or whatever. And, there, and the fact of the matter is, when you look at the growth of Twitter, when you look at the growth of Facebook, when you look at the growth of Google, it's just almost impossible to imagine. And the growth of mobility, I mean, you, you just go to a Bulls game and just take a look. If you want to understand the pervasive nature of the change, just go to a Bulls game and look out at the United Center and see where not just kids, but a, just the vast array of the audience. Look, look what they're all doing in the midst of the Bulls game, right? They're all doing this. Like one out of every two people is doing this. Not watching the game, but watching this device. So I think that change is just enormous. And it's just starting. It's the reason why, unfortunately, even though LinkedIn is trading at a crazy price, one could argue that people will actually make lots of money off that. I mean, it's impossible to know where this all goes, and it's impossible to know which company is the right company. And certainly values have gotten nutty. But I think as a company today, no matter what you're doing, to not pay attention to the Internet, the power of the social graph, and the power of mobile, and the power of connectivity, and the power to harness these tools, blogs, social sites, word of mouth, and, and really kind of get focused on it could be devastating. If you're, you know, if you're investing in TV, no one's saying TV is not important. TV is important, and a billboard is important, and radio is important. But I just think that um, the, if you go back in time, those that have underestimated the power of technology uh, tend to be eradicated. And 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 look, there's a, I don't know if Jack Greenberg's in this room, but Jack is a chairman of, was a chairman of Western Union for a long time. You know, they just stopped wiring, uh, they just stopped telegraphs like a few years ago even though the internet was you know, approaching 20 years old. So it takes a long time for people to really cycle out of an old technology. These are like titanic ships. But I think, um, I think they're powerful mediums. I, I'd, I'd build on that in a couple of quick ways. I, I've seen your statistics. I'll give you other statistics. We can have statistic <laughs> wars. But we are the biggest television spender in the world, and we're the biggest digital spender in the world. And I can, I can tell you the money is going dramatically into digital. The other is, the reason is because people are multitasking. People are watching more TV and they're watching a lot of stuff. And how do you connect those? But even if things were going slow, which I don't think they're going slow, the reality of it is people are analog. Organizations are analog. It takes time for organizations to change. If you don't have a sense of urgency now, you won't even catch up ever. We need to keep, right, yeah. keep, uh, keep track of the okay. definition of what we're talking I mean, I agree that business is ignoring the internet is probably a a problem. The question is whether the business in ignoring social media is a problem. And I think, I think, you know, but cell I, phones. So let, me, let me get Brent because Brent, you know, you, you gave Brent four seconds. Is that four? Yeah. Four seconds for Twitter. So you can do a lot on Twitter in four seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it's only 140 characters. 
Now, the, uh, I wanted to build on what Eric was saying about multitasking because it is true when, you, when you're at any event now. That if you, when we talk to uh, TV networks, our media team talks to those executives all the time because we, what we consistently see on Twitter is every single time there's a major event in America or around the world, whether it's on TV, a music festival, a political event, the number of tweets about that go way up, and as soon as it's over, it comes right back down. So it's happening in big numbers. For example, during the Video Music Awards this year on MTV, we saw over 2 million tweets from users during the show. Now, I don't know the ratings basis for that show, but if you just take the number of people tweeting about it divided by the ratings for the night, it's not insignificant how many people participated that way. And that's, that phenomena is something that, that we spend a lot of time on with both offline, online events, broadcast events, because Twitter's kind of becoming this communication layer that ties it all together. So let me <clears throat> move whether, so there's some disagreement about how quickly this is going to catch on, but there's agreement that businesses ought to pay attention. So the question would be if you are doing this, and Rashad, you said it was integrative, it was a lot of things, how do you measure this? How do you figure out whether you're making money or not? How much money should you put in? And again, you know, Matt's saying it's not growing so much, you're saying it's growing. This is, those are two different forecasts. How do, you, how do you think about ROI, return on investment, and how much you should do? You're the marketing professor. Well, I mean, first of all, first of all okay, if we're going to put it on my shoulders to start this off. I, mean, I, I started teaching an internet marketing class in 2000. I remember as I was doing my, my own reading and background preparation on this, you know, one of the things you come across more often than not was that marketing was dead, that marketing was different now that everything you learned in MBA, you had to throw it out now. And this was often at that, you know, I think 1999, the big innovation was the, the display ad. And for the really radical firm, it was that expensive Shashikli, you know, the little car would drive across the screen and get in your face, and then, you know, it would toot its horn and drive off. I mean, um, nowadays, display ads, I mean, they're standardized in shape. We use reach and frequency measures to try and assess their impact on our, on our bottom line. I mean, I think that we want to be careful before we give everything up. But, uh, but I will argue that, Social media is a little different for the reasons I said earlier. I mean, it's more than just you know sending a message to a consumer. It's a dialogue, and I think that rather than try and say what's the right message metric for evaluating a dialogue, you should take a step back from your dialogue and try and ask well, what is it we're trying to do with this dialogue. Sometimes that dialogue isn't about increasing sales per se. Sometimes it's about avoiding a cost. Um, firms are using social media, for example, to avoid customer support costs. Um, companies like Best Buy, for example, use Twitter not just to tweet and, uh, new sales and promotions to customers, they also rely on forums like Twitter to get consumers to post their own problems with their technology and to have others actually generate the responses. This is a form of crowdsourcing, it avoids a cost. And we can think of lots of situations where firms are using social media to try and do things other than just build the brand and build up sales. So you, you really want to before we start trying to decide what's the right metric to evaluate a conversation, that's a hard job, by the way, in and of itself. Maybe we should be first asking, what's the role of that conversation? I mean, this interactivity is a powerful force, and probably you can do a lot more with it than simply send brand messages out to the community. I'll spill on the Best Buy example, because I think it's a good one. Rashad <laughs> mentioned paid, owned, and earned, and that's exactly how Best Buy uses Twitter as a platform every single day. I'll give you a couple of examples, because I know not everybody's familiar with what Best Buy does on Twitter every day. So when you set up a brand, most brands in, in America now have a presence on Twitter, just like they do on Facebook and on YouTube, and they use paid search on Google. It's another marketing vehicle for them. On day one, they set up their handle, their Twitter account. On day two, people start to try to communicate with them, asking them questions and posing challenges to the business. And people at the company tweet back at them, and they try to solve problems. And that was the origin of, I could point to Best Buy and Dell and Southwest Airlines and Whole Foods <coughs> as companies that do this on a regular basis. The second thing that they do on Twitter is they can do a lot for free. So most companies have recognized that as an earned media channel, a communications channel, they connect directly with people on Twitter called followers. On Facebook, they're called fans or, or likes, and you've all seen the thumbs up button. And so corporate communications teams think, hey, it's nice to have a big follower base on Twitter. We can communicate and accomplish a lot for free. But the third way is the one, and, and we try to measure that. We try to help brands understand what's the value of a follower and when you can communicate with them X number of times per day, what's the impact on loyalty, retention, referrals, buying behavior, things like that. And I know Rashad's got an analytical group that thinks about the same thing every day. But the third case is the one that's 
on the, on the paid media side, which is no brand can connect with everybody on Facebook or everybody on Twitter, and they have to work at it. And, and both of those companies, as part of their business models, have created solutions to help marketers connect with the broader audience. And when our audience started to surpass 200 million registered user accounts, and you heard the numbers on Facebook, that becomes very lucrative to a marketer. And at some point, it pops onto Rashad's radar and his group on, on the media side, and they say, that's a big reach vehicle for us. We need to tap into that. How do you measure if it's the right reach? I mean, I think of the Pepsi refresh again, the, the, most, the, the biggest mo number of their voters are in that 41 to 60 range, which aren't per se the audience Pepsi was trying to reach when it did refresh and try to hope that it would improve market share and brand awareness. Yeah, you know, the, the Pepsi campaign's one. You can look at Old Spice and what they did. I think there's probably a lot of awareness for the Old Spice campaign and how that played <coughs> out. They had a great quarter. We had a, a promotion for Virgin America that ran across social platforms, the fourth highest sales day ever. So for every Pepsi, there's probably another case where somebody had a great result in social media. But you measure it. Measure it, for sure. But it's, what's interesting, by the way, is that, you know, people are always like, how, well, how do you measure, how, how do you measure this, how do you measure this? I mean, how do you measure the success of the TV campaign? I mean, yeah, how do you, how do you measure the success of a billboard? Right, right. What's, it's the old line, what, we know half of it works, we just don't know which half. And not only that, people, people are unbelievably willing to say, well, I have to invest in my brand, so I'll spend hundreds of millions of dollars on this campaign that's very hard to measure. But I'm, I'm hesitant to invest in online when you can actually follow a click stream and see what happens. You can see who's communicating with you. You can see what they click. I mean, you know, in our case, our, our whole business is built on a very simple proposition. When lifetime value is greater than customer acquisition cost, we invest. And that CAC is a direct PPC. It's a pay-per-click, you know, we get X number of impressions, X number of clicks, turns into X number of subscribers, Y number of customers, Z amount of profit. So very discernible. I mean, it's, it's, it's deeply measurable. For instance, many of these businesses are data businesses. The reality is that, you know, group audit at the heart of it has got so much amazing data. So does Apple. For instance, if you actually, you know, utilize iAds, they use iTunes information to do it. An incredible amount of information, which, 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 which they basically have. So these are highly, highly driven data businesses. These are also businesses where, to a certain extent, by connecting television to these other elements, you can make television more measurable. Uh, because you can follow people down to sales, you can follow them into a lot of uh, 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 other things. And the economics are of three types. One is the economics are, you take your traditional media and you make it more measurable. The second is you eliminate a whole bunch of costs, including for instance, and the third is you get closer to your customer. In lots of companies, Twitter and Facebook are deeply tied into their customer relationship management platforms uh, and not into their you know, quote unquote advertising platforms. So you can measure it, you're going to and you're going to do it when it's valuable. So take that from the micro level where you have you know a company doing it to the macro level, and there, there are more or less two perspectives out there. Uh, Eric Qualman wrote a book called Social Nomics, which is uh, a book about how social nomics is going to change the world, and its tagline is, it's a people-driven economy, stupid, which is you know, related to what some of you have said. And he believes that social media is going to save billions of hours of productivity, make companies more accountable and efficient, make products and services better. So you have this view that this is going to be terrific, it's terrific now, it's just going to get better. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you have other views, maybe Matt is one of them, but a uh, more prominent one perhaps is uh, Blogger, <laughs> or Blogger, I don't know if Matt has written this down, but uh, there's a blogger and economist, Tyler Cowan, who is actually a PhD classmate of mine, uh, who wrote uh, a piece that said the pace of innovation is slowing, not speeding up. And according to him, for all its promise, the internet doesn't employ many people or create much growth. So the question I want to throw out all of you is, who's right? Is the social web and social media and all this technological change going to lead to a lot of productivity improvement and increased growth? Uh, or is it going to be a non-event in a macro sense? I mean, I, I, again, I think, <laughs> I, 
it seems to me somewhat important to continue to distinguish between the internet and social media. Tyler's point was that the economic impact of the internet as a whole is difficult to measure so far, and I think, um, I, mean, I think I agree with that, but I actually think the productivity implications of the internet and improved communication technology, the information sharing, all of the kind of stuff that the, that the web brings, the productivity impact of mobile technologies, if you put all that stuff together, I think it's likely to be huge without question. Um, you know, there were a lot of studies in, in, in the 90s where people were trying to measure the productivity impact of computers, which is something which we now have very good evidence did have big productivity in, impacts across all kinds of firms. That was very difficult to measure early on, and a lot of the papers in that area sort of concluded there's a puzzle here because computers seem to be having no impact on productivity. Eventually, over time, as, as that expanded and the data got better and the studies got better, people could find it. So I think the internet will affect productivity without question. Will Facebook and Twitter and social media affect productivity? I think, obviously, as you alluded to, that seems less clear to me. I think it's, there is certainly no evidence that they have yet affected productivity, and it would be shocking to me if they have, given how, how small a phenomenon they still are. But, but the, the one thing I would say is what Qualman is really talking about in that book is the, the, the thing that he kind of predicts is going to transform business something I actually kind of agree with, which is, and, and people have alluded to this already, the, the ability of people to share information about products and to find information about products more efficiently has really profound implications. The fact that if I want to go buy a, you know, a baby stroller, I now have access to this huge array of direct reactions <coughs> from other people their experiences with these baby strollers. I can communicate with people about it. I can get feedback. And, and, and the ability of me to kind of discover new products that are maybe small and niche that I might have had a hard time finding before. That stuff seems to me like it really does change in a big way the, the, the landscape. The music industry is probably the best example of where this has already sort of happened, where you used to have record companies having a huge amount of influence because finding music was really difficult for people. And the only way I could find music was to go to the local record store. And therefore, everything had to go through this distribution channel and these big record companies controlled everything. You now have this much more democratic kind of world where it's much easier for people to find things, to figure out other people who like stuff similar to them. And, and I think that really does have profound implications. But that's not about Facebook. I mean, it's, it's partly about these social media technologies. I think they contribute to that. But it's also about Yelp and Angie's List and... Uh, iTunes and all, you know, the, something much broader than the topic today, which is the internet makes it easier for people to share, to post to discussion boards, to do all this kind of broad array of things that, that make it, and, and to search engines too. I mean, I think Google has a profound impact on the difficulty that I have in discovering a new product that I might want to buy. So there's, there's a much broader array of things that contribute to this, but I, I would kind of agree with, if you define it that way, I would agree that the implications are pretty big. It also depends how we think of social media. I mean, we're sort of focusing on these very prominent marketing type consumer oriented forms of social media, but a lot of companies are creating social media internally to solve problems and create efficiencies. I mean, Best Buy has their very famous emphasis was their Blue Shirt Nation, which was a social network for employees, and they actually claim, I mean, I haven't seen measured data to prove this, but they claim that the retention rate on employees is like, or turnover rates are considerably lower for the people they manage to get to use the site. Of course, we can think of all the reasons there might be a selection problem here, but at the very least, they claim that job turnover for someone who uses Blue Shirt Nation is about 20% versus over 50% for people who don't. I mean, Dow Chemical last year created a social media site for the company to help managers locate the right talent across business units, and a really radical thing they did was they even included retirees into this social network because they reminded that retirees might still want to be involved with the company and bring a lot of human capital that could be used to solve certain problems. So, you know, I mean, one way that we could see real productive gains from social media isn't just from these consumer-oriented brands, although they have their own sorts of promises for the, for, the, for the online economy, at least, but even internally to an organization. I would, I would just build, and I would say the ramifications we can define, you know, what we, we had dif difficulty defining social media, but the sole idea of people connecting with each other, utilizing new technologies, let's say that's some sort of definition without having you know, the Facebooks and Twitters. I believe it is impacting every single business. And I'm going to give you two s examples. 
One is the New York Times, which I work with, because I work with a lot of traditionals. Okay. The New York Times, despite Bill Keller having written the Twitter trap, which is a very nice article which he wrote yesterday, uh, he's the editor-in-chief, uh, they have put so much amazing technology built around how to spread their stories utilizing social. They've got some state-of-the-art stuff. But more importantly, guess how people actually on their phones read the New York Times or on the web? Most popular, most emailed. That's the front page. They already know that. It's not their front page. Okay? It's most popular, most emailed. Now let me give you another thing. Education. Thank the Lord the University of Chicago is a good school. I have a big question as to why people should actually pay a whole bunch of money when in the future they could get these professors. I would point to a simple thing called the Khan Academy on YouTube. Okay? Uh, and there's now proven fact that the Khan Academy in combination with schoolwork is better than schoolwork by itself. And that's on YouTube. You talk about television, three billion videos watched every month, every week on YouTube. You know, 550 million people. The ramifications are huge. And if you, there's, if you are basically selling coal, it's going to impact your business. Just that you don't have the imagination on how it's going to impact your business. So I'm struck by some of this, actually. Some of the things that, that Rashad just said and that Matt said actually make people better off, but actually reduce GDP. So your music example is a perfect example that people are better off. They listen much more to the music they want to, but that industry has reduced in size. Recorded music clear. has gone down in size, mm -hmm. but not the music industry. Look at all the people spending money in live concerts not, and everything. I'm not so sure what the, the answer on that is from the, you know, overall. It's, not, it's, it's, it's certainly not clear. not clear that it reduces GDP. Right. It, 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 it makes things much more efficient and it sort of shifts the balance of power, but, but whether it really reduces total output in that industry, it seems. Or let me rephrase Unlikely. It's not clear it's increasing hugely, even though it's satisfying. Consumer sure. surplus is almost certainly increasing by more than it's showing up in GDP. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me shift now to where, uh, where the world is going. And uh, we, we now have LinkedIn, again, which had this uh, huge valuation uh, as a comparison. I'll give you two comparisons. Uh, when Google went public, it was valued at 15 times sales. So LinkedIn is 33 times sales. Uh, Google is 60 times cash flow. LinkedIn is 200 times cash flow. Um, so by that measure, it's kind of crazy. On the other hand, remember, the internet companies, when they went public, uh, they didn't have revenues or cash flow. So the ratios were infinite. Um, so you know, the question is, where are we now? Is, uh, are we in? Uh, a crazy place? Are we in a reasonable place? And, and I'm the finance professor, so I probably shouldn't be asking this, uh, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Are you asking us to stock pick for you? <laughs> well, I'm just asking, hey, what, what do you make? I'll, I'll pose a question. What do, you, what, do you make, what do you make of it and what, what implications so does it have? So throw away one day of trading on a very small amount of stock available to the public and just raise your hand if you use LinkedIn more today than you did five years ago. So that's why, as a category, there are companies doing, you know, creating a lot of utility for people. It's a professional network in LinkedIn's case. It's saving people a lot of money in, in Groupon's case. Uh, but there are real businesses being built. And yesterday you got a signal from one. You got to peek under the covers at the economics of a company. But uh, it was a good day for LinkedIn. They've done a lot of work to get there. They were rewarded yesterday. And it's just one of many businesses in this category that are being created. Yeah, and I think the, the um, look, it's hard. I mean, I mean, I'm completely biased, so I, mean, I hope they're <laughs> radically undervalued. But I mean, um, <laughs> I think, it's, um, I think it's, it's the unknown, right? It's the unknown. It's just the unknown. It's very, it's very confusing for people to be investing in these types of companies because ultimately, I mean, Google went out at a $15 billion value, but you know, it's, people look back at that in hindsight as an insanely low valuation and a terrible IPO. And certainly, you'd have done well uh, owning owning Google, you, even if you would have overpaid, even if it would have gone out at two times that value, and would have traded at 40 times revenue or whatever it is. You know, it would have been it would have paled in, in the comparison to the market cap today. So, I think the challenge for for most investors and, and the people that are building and running these businesses is none of us have any idea where it, where it ends. I mean, the the businesses at the top of that paradigm 
Groupon being one, Twitter being another, are showing um, certain growth characteristics that just are staggering. And you, you know there's an end, there has to be an end, but you don't quite know where it is. And so it's very tricky to run these businesses, and it's also tricky to, uh, to be investing in them because to some extent that's what creates this kind of panic to get in is that at the end of the day, you know, um, there will be a select number of companies most likely that hold a very unique position and they will be big, big businesses, you know, and no one quite knows does Amazon get to 60 billion and slow down or 100 billion or 500 billion? But it certainly is much easier to run Amazon than it is to run Walmart in certain ways. Right? It's a pretty risky strategy for picking stocks to walk around looking at seemingly overvalued companies and say, well, it might be Google. I mean, if we knew which ones were going to be Google and which ones weren't going to be Google, we'd, we'd be doing pretty well. But I don't, I don't know if there's any, it seems crazy to me. I'm, I'm no expert at all in this area. I'm, I don't do finance. I don't pick stocks. I don't, so, so what do I know? But um, it does, you know, I, I, I tried to figure this out, not being an expert. I think like the price earnings ratio uh, for LinkedIn is like five times the price earnings ratio for the NASDAQ as a whole at the peak of the tech bubble. Um, which seemed to me like a lot. I don't know. Uh, and it, it sort of has all the hallmarks of froth and bubble, where people kind of, they're not too focused on what, you know, nothing is about what is happening right now with these companies. It's all about what might happen someday. And, and, and it all feels to me, uh, you know, like it, it looks a lot like a kind of fad in high school or something, where this is the, Popular thing, pop, popular bandwagon. Everybody's jumping, jumping on. I mean, it may all, it may be true. I mean, Facebook. It may be that we all live our lives on Facebook in the future, and Google is gone because we do search on Facebook, and online retail is gone because we do online retail on Facebook, and and this really becomes the, you know, like the new Wintel uh, platform that dominates the world. In which case, um, we should all go buy these things. The other thing with LinkedIn is a little funny. Is this, I, I don't know that. Do we really think in the long run that to the extent these kind of social networking things are important, that they're going to be, continue to be split across different platforms. I, I would think that if there's really a lot of money to be made there, Facebook would have a big advantage in trying to create within Facebook some kind of professional side to the, to the network. That I have no idea about. I'm not a finance person, though I went to, went to the school. Uh, and I haven't started companies, nor do I have trading stuff. But I'll tell you, I think, two or three things. Again, forgetting about LinkedIn specifically, you know, one company nobody knows. But if you actually go and you see what goes on at Google, and you go and see what goes on at Apple, they begin to really have amazing network effects. And that's once you have those amazing network effects, and if you can iterate fast and continuously improve on those network effects, it gets very hard for anybody to catch up. Uh, Yesterday, it was yesterday, I saw some products from both Google and I can't, Apple never tells you about anything in the future, right? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, on their campus, they say, I went to the Apple campus and that's all I can tell you about. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's the t-shirt I bought for our daughters, one of them who works at Google, and she left. Okay, but the, 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 the reality of it is, if you see what they've got with, with technology, some of that technology, the data, the speed, and the engineering, is really hard for people to and later on come on with unless there's a seismic shift. And that's what people are betting on. There'll be few winners. There won't be too many winners. But we don't know which ones. So, there, so you're more optimistic. Are there any other platforms that uh, are coming that you see that are going to be in this category? I think they're going to be platforms. Yeah, I mean, you're saying there are very few and there are network effects. I think they're going to be platforms. Most of the things... We, We've never, we, we never see these things coming because the future comes from the slime and not so they the just, They just come. Right? It always, we, we never see these things coming. We never saw Groupon coming. We, we, you know, we, we didn't see Groupon coming. We were here in Chicago, right? So, so that's right. The, that gives you an idea of, when, when people said, you know, Microsoft's unbeatable, then we, the year came Google. Google's unbeatable, well, Facebook's gonna take them to the cleaners. No one's gonna take anyone to the cleaners. It's, it's hard to tell. But I think there's going to be some remarkable companies coming from outside the United States. Let me just say, with, with all due respect, Richard, that another thing that is a hallmark of these past bubbles is the, this, this kind of 
analogy in which everything uh, gets brought together. So I don't know what the relevance, it's true Google is an amazingly efficient and productive company if you go to Google, uh, used to work at Google, they got like really, really smart people there and they managed to kind of magically make a lot of really, really great stuff. I don't know what the relevance of that is for LinkedIn. In 1999, everybody was saying, you know, look at how Yahoo and AOL are taking over the world, therefore pets.com should be worth a lot kind of by loose analogy because, you know, it's like the internet and that's also, and it's .com and that's .com. I think, I think loose analogy is incredibly dangerous. And I think if we want to know whether LinkedIn is overvalued, we need to talk about LinkedIn. If we want to know whether social media is going to change the world and we define that to mean platforms where people have friends and interact in social ways, uh, we, we need to focus on that and not slip into saying anywhere where people communicate with each other, that's social media, no, and therefore... No, no, it, it's not that. What tends to basically happen is what we know that when market leaders take off, they tend to have network effects if they can stay market leaders. Now, MySpace didn't. They, had, they also didn't have their crappy technology, among other things. But what, what, what tends to basically happen is then they have these cycles, which we've seen in, on Amazon in, in the United States. You've seen it on Facebook, but we don't know the valuation. We've seen it on Google. And we've seen it on a lot of other things. LinkedIn looks like... Forget about all the numbers. LinkedIn looks like it's the place where business people go. It looks like. There is, there is no direct competitor to LinkedIn. And most people who use Facebook also use LinkedIn when they start getting into business. It's not come together. So if you look at current behavior and you look at one market leader, you say maybe. Evaluation, who the hell knows? I don't know those things. But that's the reason why people, and what's the float, 18 million or some? But it's actually, it's a great point, which is, I yeah. think, and this is the inherent challenge, is that the, the point you made is great, except you, you would have made it not to buy Facebook at $100 million value. You would have made the same argument not to invest in Twitter at $100 million. I, mean, I would have told, if any of my MBA students came to me with the idea for Groupon, yeah. I would have told them, that's and a terrible right, idea. Right. So, <laughs> so, so, the so I really don't know anything about this, right. I, 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 so, for sure. It's just great to have you on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so the inherent, I think the inherent challenge is, look, none of us, none of us pick stocks for a living, so it's a, t it's a hard question to answer. But I think the, the, the point here is, uh, you know, when you, when you talk about LinkedIn, you know, there's this guy named Yuri Milner who's become a very well-known investor from DST, and he has a black hole theory, and it's served him at least at the present moment pretty well, which is these things are like concentric black holes that just suck everything else in. I think it's similar to your network effect point, yeah. which is, you know, LinkedIn, it, it, these, they tend to retain enormous value. So even though other things come up and, and it, it's possible that something could fall apart, it's possible Groupon could become the next MySpace and something else will become the next. But ultimately, you know, you could make a pretty compelling argument that when it comes to social commerce, Groupon will have a very large place. And when it comes to, you know, professional networks, that'll be LinkedIn. And when it comes to social networks, it'll be Facebook. And so, the, you know, in theory, if you believe that the trend lines are very positive and up, then one day what looks like an insane valuation will seem small. What I will tell you is this. This is a, this is a, people can lose tons of money, um, and they do, and they invest in the last bubble and lost tons of money. But the people who are buying LinkedIn stock are among the smartest investors in the world. These are no stupid people, and they live through the last bubble. So, they're not, so not only are they extremely intelligent, but they, but they have real, real wisdom of pain that's current. Yes. So <laughs> to the extent that they're putting a lot of money behind it, in theory... They at, least, they at least have a theory, right? And, and, and it's probably not a crazy theory. I just wanted to add one last thing. And as I think part of the problem here is that a lot of the, just by looking at what people are using today, I don't think we can determine what's going to be valuable in the long term. A lot of the stuff people are doing with social media is gimmicky. I mean, 10 years ago, the, there was a period of two weeks where the most successful online display campaign was a display ad that said party naked. Um, they beat every other display campaign. The, the landing page for that was the most traffic site for two weeks. I can't even remember what it was. It was a company that just sort of party naked, and then they bring you to their website. I mean, we have companies like P&G today in the same vein, you know, asking consumers to upload one-minute commercials for Pepto-Bismol on YouTube, and people are racing to upload commercials, and everyone's ready to, to claim that, you know, advertising is going to be outsourced in the future. This is going to be a co-created thing. But these are gimmicks. And I guess what we want to figure out is which things are being used now and are going to continue to be being used versus which thing are getting used now because people are curious, but tomorrow they're not going to be curious anymore and they'll go by the wayside. And I, I'm not qualified to answer which ones will work and which ones won't. But the gimmicks are partly clouding our judgment. Okay, so I am told that now is a good time to get questions for the audience. And so I think there are some microphones 
over there if people have questions that I have not asked and that we have not answered. And uh, why don't, uh, is that uh, Eddie, are you uh, making your way? You want to? Uh, my name is Eddie Winehouse. I'm an online publisher who works with large media organizations. I feel a small connection with everyone up there. Thank you guys for coming. You gave uh, the definition of social media, um, with Professor Dubay boiled it down to two points, interactivity and co-creation. But I noticed someone really talked about publishing or broadcast. Um, and this gets a little bit to the point of the quality of the information that's actually in social media. So I'm just going to say a statement, and I'd like your response, <clears throat> that uh, the, so the social media being published is largely noise. And if it's not, then it's probably a time waste. And if it's not that, then to whom is it most worth publishing it? Can I take that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly not. <laughs> I was going to tell Matt to take if you, it. <laughs> if, if, if you basically want to see stuff that is either gimmicky or time waste, you can see it. If you know how to utilize any of these things, you can actually use that as massive assets. So I'm going to give you an example. I, I tweet like crazy. I write a blog. And those are things that, for most people, are hilarious and a time waste. Okay? But for my clients and for 5,000 people, it's more valuable than most of what they read in that age. So it's a question of who do you follow who do you, how do you filter and what do you do? Because the basic belief that only one group of people have knowledge and everybody else just sit by, not true. Each of you all are experts in something particularly great. And there is a group of people who would like to learn from you. Rashad visited Twitter yesterday in San Francisco and I think he, it sounds like he paid attention. Because that, that would have been almost my exact answer, which is there's a lot of social media. It's a very broad definition. You heard that earlier. But if you filter it, curate, and that's one of the nice things we all have tools to be able to do today. I follow Rashad. I, I can tell you my life, my professional life is enriched because I follow Rashad and others like him. Well, there's also this notion that bigger is better. We, we, we view the word network effect got thrown around during this discussion as well. But not every connection is a useful connection, and some net connections are actually bad connections. And we have to be careful. I'm sorry to rehash the Pepsi refresh campaign again, but I mean, you know, the fact that you have millions of registered users doesn't mean that you had the impact you're looking for. There might have been 100,000 registered users you missed that would have been vastly superior in terms of creating buzz and brand awareness because they would have been the opinion leaders that you'd hope to bring into your network. So, I, I, yeah, I, th there's no question that social web is full of all kinds of gimmicky, time-wasting content, but people love that. I mean, this is. This is people go on there to share photos of themselves and what they did yesterday, and they play Farmville. I mean, this is not an activity which is largely about you know kind of high intellectual education. <laughs> I think and, that's and great, it, and it doesn't show up in GDP. So the question is, are there concerns about privacy, which you know we touched on briefly, but uh, that's worth uh, a response. Tar targetability is one of the most attractive aspects of social media, but I think Matt already nailed this problem earlier, which is, on the one hand, I don't want to get an ad that's completely incompatible with what I'm doing at that current moment in time or incompatible with my life. I still find it amazing that local business schools, I won't name them, still send me ad materials to get an executive MBA. These are very untargeted <laughs> mailings, obviously. Um, <laughs> But at the same time, I find it eerie sometimes that I'll, be, I'll get an email from someone I haven't spoken to overseas in a while, they have a foreign name, and all of a sudden I'm getting junk mail in my email box from alleged senders who have very similar names. So obviously somebody's listening in on my conversations, and I find that creepy, and I would probably find it off-putting if I got a targeted ad that had that person's name in it as well. Here's, here's something we should all hope for with privacy. Obviously, it's a big topic for any company in this category. It's a very technical topic. And what we should hope for is that the people that make decisions around privacy have all of the information they need to make good decisions because uh, the, the topic is a mile wide. It is very, very technical. If you read the Wall Street Journal's report on this topic six months ago, whenever that series ran, you could get lost in paragraph three if you, could, if you didn't work in the business and kind of follow the dialogue. And there are people, smart people, in Washington, D.C. and other places around the world that have to make some big decisions around this. And 
let's all hope that they are very well educated on how exactly all of this works. Yeah, I, I, just one thing that seems, this kind of comes back to the question of do you want your telemarketer, uh, you know, knowing where, where you were last night, that it's important to remember that the reason that Facebook was so successful initially, I think, whereas MySpace and Friendster and these other things had not been, so it was precisely that they let people limit what they were sharing to some closed network of people who they kind of approved. So initially, obviously, these things started on university campuses, and it was very exclusive, and you couldn't join Facebook unless you were at one of those universities. And subsequently, you know, the whole, the, 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 this kind of closed, highly controlled network. Now, we're kind of surprised that people want to be friends and broadcast stuff as widely as they do, but I think for firms who are thinking of using, say, Facebook as a platform where when I go on Facebook, I get a lot of messages from a lot of different firms about what, what I should buy, that, that seems, you know, I don't really want to be friends with General Motors or something. <laughs> I want to be friends with my friends and use this as a platform to interact socially. And I think most of what happens right now on these social networks is social interaction, is not people talking about which brands they like and people sending feedback to companies. And I think there may be a lot of scope for that there, but there's a risk of, if it gets kind of flooded with that kind of activity, there's a risk of it becoming a lot less appealing to people, which is not exactly privacy, but, but, but there is this, this value to people in controlling the, the, what they receive and from whom. Hi, I'm uh, Scott Turner with GFK MRI and Rashad. I've been following your uh, your post this week. You've had an incredible week uh, touring some companies in uh, in Silicon Valley. In fact, I don't know when you slept. I got a tweet that says you were just at Twitter's headquarters checking I in. Was. So, I was. I um, was. <laughs> but in in a couple of your posts this uh, this week, you alluded to uh, some of the things you saw from those companies, and and perhaps it's the networked effect you were referring to earlier. Could you talk a little bit more about sort of what you learned this week or, or any common threads that you might see that, that weave these companies together? Sure. I'm going to give you an address. It's at Rishad T. R-I-S-H-A-D-T. So later you can understand what he was saying and then you could decide how much of it is garbage and how much of it is not. Uh, but but one, of the, one of the key things you know, without a doubt, is we're sort of looking for what's the next axe of everybody. Because, the, 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 and there were three big learnings that I had. The first learning was the really successful companies are completely fixated on the end user. They are maniacs. They just, the end user is the only thing that, they, that matters. The second is they have audacious long-term plans. The third, you may not want to hear this, is they don't give a damn about Wall Street. Okay, they really don't. In fact, again and again, they would basically, and, and, and you know, these are the Facebooks, the Googles, and the Apples of the world. They really don't care. Uh, they basically care the end consumer, constant iteration, audacious long-term plans, which is the first thing that we learned. The second is, everything I read about, like in the Wall Street Journal, which basically was so that he could get a Pulitzer Prize, that whole series was completely riddled with errors. It was useless, okay? Uh, and, 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 the, and the reality of it simply is that one of the biggest things that these com all these companies have is they're doing much more than people talk about. And nobody listens to them, you know, to a great extent. For instance, if you think about paid, owned, earned, YouTube is a fantastic social engine. Search is a way that you actually discover stuff. And if you actually see what they're doing on search, you actually discover Twitter and Facebook on search. Think about local. You know, if you think about local as Groupon being local, think about maps and the interface with what's going on with mapping and maps. And, and that's the remarkable thing, that how all these people are working at amazing stuff, like on the cloud, where Apple's going to come out. They, they won't tell you anything about the future, but you have to be a dumbass not to see where this is going. Right? <laughs> uh, so so, so the, the reality of it is, there's an in, the thing that I find amazing is people are underestimating what young people, fast-moving, free technology and continuous iteration is doing. It's not that these people aren't making mistakes, but they're making them so fast and correcting them so fast you don't even see it. And that's true for this company too, you know, Groupon. Uh, it's just, they're fast. They do stuff fast. And it's always good. Uh, you've been waiting for me. <clears throat> So um, 
my question to you, I've listened to this, that's great. Uh, what is the next step? Where is the future? I mean, you've done some incredible things. You've marketed, you've learned how to market this, you've produced a great company. Uh, what's next? Where do you see this going? What is the next step? What's the breakthrough? This is, this is for Eric? This is for Eric, right? Well, it's for all of you. Or, or Brent, okay. <laughs> Eric and Brad are the ones who've been University of Chicago, <laughs> Chicago booth, we're trying to figure that out. So go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, I, don't, I mean, I don't know what's, um, I, th I think it's very hard for people who are swept up in this particular moment in time on the operating level, uh, meaning Groupon and Twitter, I think it's very hard to imagine what's next because you can't possibly imagine the end of this journey. Um, I mean, if you, th if you think about what's really staggering is Groupon was, uh, we, we launched in Chicago in October of 08. Um, roughly five quarters ago, we had maybe 100 employees, give or take. So five quarters later, we have nearly 10,000 employees. Um, you know, so we're adding almost, at this point, almost 1,000 employees a month in 47 countries. Um, we now add, we have about 100 million subscribers. It grows by three or four million a week. And it's not as if it's slowing down. Even in a city like Chicago, our subscriber count is up near 2 million. It's three times the size of the Chicago Tribune. And it grows by 20, 25,000 a week. So the question is, where are all these people coming from? And, and where does it end? And when does it slow down? And I think Twitter, you know, if we had, you know, if we had um, you know, the Twitter guys who were here from the beginning kind of walking through the evolution early on in those months, they probably would say the same thing, which is you, you're, you're on this S-curve. You just have no idea where you are. So I think for the people running those companies, we have to, we have to just kind of take this journey to wherever it leads us. To, to, there's a whole bunch of people right below. And I think to your point, there's a, there is a great, you know, when, when, when we start valuing pets.com as much as Google, we all have a huge problem. And I think, and, and, and there's certainly some of that going on in private equity today. And we, we run a firm called LightBank. Valuations of early and mid-stage tech companies are very frothy. And one could argue somewhat insane. but. Um, but we'll see where, where that goes. But ultimately, the companies that are at the top of this, um, uh, you know, kind of mountain are are are, uh, are just on a ride. And I think there's there's no idea what's next because this thing is just so fast and so big. And um, and I and I think what, what what I'm hoping happens down the road is that each of these companies, because it would be a shame to have any of them do badly. It'd be a shame for LinkedIn to fall apart or Groupon or Twitter. I hope this crop of companies you know, Zynga and all the way down that pike really fulfill their promise and become great businesses that, that kind of anchor America in a next generation of fantastic companies that employ hundreds of thousands of people and go off and make the world a better place. Hi. Oh, go ahead. Uh, my name is Ben Foster. I'm a digital strategist with Ketchum. Uh, curious about the Pepsi refresh. So much of the story has been about the money spent and how they lost share. Is there, could you discuss or have you seen evidence if there's a story around what Coke was doing and their active, activity on social networks in integration with the Verrata campaign? I mean, Coke is just kind of ironic because Coke had withdrawn from the big picture advertising like Super Bowl ads and such, that sort of thing for almost most of the, the beginning of the 21st century or first decade of the 21st century. And I mean, I don't think, I, I want to be hesitant before I say exactly what they did and what Pepsi did because I actually don't think we can just tie a causal relationship between Refresh and Pepsi's market share right now. I haven't seen any kind of experiment that was run to try and assess the true effect of Refresh. In, in fairness, Pepsi also messed around with this logo and there was a lot of backlash online on social media um, that people found the new logos hard to read and that Pepsi shouldn't have messed around with their logo. So who knows what, whether maybe one effect is dominating the other. Coke, to the best of my knowledge, was doing mostly what it had always done. It's had a, a strong online presence for a while. Coke has been doing some sort of in, some innovative work online, again, in the domain of co-creation, um, encouraging people. They had, a, they had a campaign last year, I'm sorry, I, don't, I forget the details now, which involved trying to create videos of some sort where people would literally show photos, videos, where they have Coke cans in their everyday life, and these would be put online and then voted on. So, I mean, whether these things have benefits for the overall bottom line, I don't think I could answer that. I, I, I can fill in a couple of the gaps there. Sure. They, they, uh, Coke, to answer your question, has been pretty active in digital media and social media, just like some of the other companies, including Pepsi. For one, one example would be their World Cup integration last year. They were a big World Cup sponsor. It was a big World Cup year. And they were all over social media talking about the fans, where fans had traveled from, and, and made a big play out of their, social, of, out of their World Cup sponsorship. 
a more recent example, and this was only a couple of weeks old, is they were in the studio with Maroon 5. So Coke as a brand has to tie entertainment into what they do quite often. You see that in a lot of their, their creative work. And two weeks ago, they ran a campaign online where they had Maroon 5 in the studio for the day. And they asked users online, including on Twitter, to tweet at them with lyrics they'd like to see incorporated into the song that Maroon 5 was going to make that day in the studio. And you can imagine the reaction and how fast that was retweeted and passed around and how many people became aware of what Coke was up to that day. And they had a live broadcast studio experience online. No other media pointing to it other than a few social media outlets. Successful campaign. Song gets created with lyrics from users. One of, one of the things also is advertising. Does it alone associate any of this? There's, there's lots of other stuff besides advertising. If it was just advertising, it would be fantastic, but it isn't. Uh, Pepsi has a very different strategy because while we think about Pepsi as Pepsi, the drink is only a very small part of the company. It's really Frito-Lay and Quaker Oats and a whole bunch of other stuff. There's a fantastic article, and not the most recent, but the issue before on Pepsi strategies, the cover with Osama in the New Yorker magazine. And you should get read that, and unfortunately it's behind lock and key online. Uh, otherwise I would have pointed to it, but subscribe. Um, and it's this amazing strategy that Pepsi has. And because of that global strategy, what they're doing makes sense. Even though it might actually hurt Pepsi, Pepsi the drink in the short run. Coke is actually not a food company. It's a beverage company. And, and there's, a, there's a completely different strategic thing. The other part with Coke, which is very interesting, is even in the world of social media, I think people don't realize that the Coke site on Facebook isn't run by Coke. It's run by fans of Coke that they co-opted. So what tends to happen is it's much more fun with you know, Coke being the official thing than something that is holier than thou. They got the voice right. And those are the subtle things that you have to do with packaging, distribution, which is far more complicated than you know, just advertising. Okay, one last question from the audience. Go ahead. I think I heard Eric, um, I'm sorry, William Nelson uh, for your capital management. I think I heard you mention earlier uh, the lifetime value of acquiring a customer versus the, the future value of the customer. That's great, but I, what I would really like to hear more from you, really the panel, is more insights around how do you strike that balance between um, direct response marketing versus the brand building aspect. So if you could kind of speak more about that intuition about how do you strike that right balance based upon a limited amount of um, capital and resources. I mean, it's a, it's, I don't know, it's a very, it's a tough call. I mean, I don't think there's any kind of, I mean, you probably have a more you know, thoughtful response. It's, um, it's a tough call. I think m most companies these days are thinking about both. You have to be sensitive to your brand and, and, how, to, and how it gets built over time, but the fact that some of these dollars online are so measurable is intoxicating. Um, you know, if you look at a company like Amazon, I think they'll, their customer acquisition cost they'll go out to about three years. A company like Groupon might go to 18 months. Um, other companies that are uh, newer, you, know, you may have you may have payback in six months, depending on you know where you are. But the fact that you can measure it down, that, you, that every dollar you spend, you can measure the ROI down to months, is just intoxicating. And so. That's why you see, you know, when you look at kind of Google's growth month over month, and it's, you know, it's just kind of because they have a machine, and that machine is very efficient, and more and more money's flowing into it. Yeah, I, I would, I would say that it's just a question of what category you're in. In some categories, you can, because if you sell stuff online or you can have a sale, which is a lead, can be worth something. Whether it's a insurance lead, you can actually qualify it. In some cases, like food products, it's much harder. In beverages, it's much harder. So there's much more on brand. So there what people do is they utilize these new technologies just to target better, to get insights better, and to better allocate. But they, it'll never become lifetime value because it just doesn't work in those categories right now that well. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question, and this came from Twitter, so that's good. We're doing social media ourselves. <laughs> um, from at Papillon C. And the question is, don't you think that the next generation will have a big impact in making social media a huge part of our lives? So this is, I guess, a forward-looking question that as more and more young people who use this all the time get older and start having money, this has to get bigger. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Matt, Matt, you're the only contrarian here. 
Bigger. Bigger? Okay, just uh, how much bigger? Okay, I think anything any of you want to say about the future before I, uh, I close? Any uh, future words of wisdom other than uh, what we've talked about, what's going to happen? Good luck. Good luck. Okay, then, I, then I'm, I'm going to end and say, you know, what I've heard or what I've been struck by is the, the focus on network effects and network effects being powerful. And when you look at the companies that succeeded from the first dot-com boom, you know, the ones that are here, Google, Amazon, eBay in particular, those were network effect companies. And I think the companies that are, you know, have emerged as the big platforms are A, network effect companies, B, are actually making money now, which was not true of a lot of these other companies in the dot-com era. You know, except for some of the, the network companies. eBay and Google did make money relatively early. Amazon didn't. So I think I, I'd be more optimistic about these companies sticking around for a long time. Whether they're appropriately valued or not right now, I think is, is debatable uh, because the valuations are so high. I think it is really different that you've got greater accountability and that the end user is much more important than uh, the end user was in the past, and I think that that has really changed. And uh, as a result, I think you'll continue to see a lot of innovation and a lot of change, which is really what we've heard today. So let me thank uh, our five panelists for.